pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Hey, we are in uh, a book of Joshua right now. That's our series. And um, uh, if you would, open up your Bibles to Joshua 10. As you're opening up your Bibles, I just want to say uh, welcome to all of you. And if there, I don't think there are any visitors, but if I'm missing anyone, we want to welcome you as well. My name's Pastor Bruce. Uh, And then we also want to say hello to those who are calling in and those who are watching on the live stream. Great to have you with us this morning. Um, We are in this... uh, book of Joshua, and uh, last week we took a look at, look at the Gibeonites and how they deceived Israel. Um, this week the story just continues to flow and continues on. You know, in the original Hebrew manuscripts, there were no chapter breaks or no verse breaks. And so last week um, we took a look at a very shrewd and deceptive Gibeon um, as they tricked Israel into thinking that they were from a distant land, when really they were from about 19 miles away. And uh, somehow uh, the word was out that God was going to have Israel wipe out all the inhabitants of Canaan because of their horrendous and abominable sinfulness. They were a very, very sinful people. And so God was going to take them out and he was going to give Israel this land of Canaan. Uh, But Gibeon comes up with a deceptive ruse, a trick, and it is uh, to trick Israel into making a covenant with them, which Israel did because they forgot to check with God. Well, as I said, the trick works, and about three days later, Israel comes to the realization of what has happened, and they are mad. And so they approach Gibeon, and some wanted to destroy Gibeon, but the leaders stopped them, one, because they had made a covenant, and they wanted to hold to that agreement. They extended mercy upon Gibeon. Because let's face it, for all of us here, if we ever entered into that kind of a contract based on all of those lies, that contract would be null and void. And yet, Israel holds to the contract. They're merciful. Well, today, as we continue on in the first 14 verses of Joshua 10, I've entitled this message exactly what happens, Israel's response to Gibeon's call for help. I've subtitled it this, God's abundant grace flowing through his people. You'll see what I mean as we continue into the message. So let's start in verse 1. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem. We're going to stop right there. We didn't get very far. Um, First thing is, who is this king of Jerusalem? Who is this Adonai Zedek? Well, um, that's probably not his real name. That is more of a title than it is a name. Uh, And that title is pretty lofty. It's Lord God Master. Um, And um, I don't know what this king's real name is. Maybe it's Jimmy or Bobby or Billy Bob, but his title is Lord God Master. And so he thinks pretty highly of himself. And now you may be thinking, well, hang on. I thought Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. Well, you would be right in that, but you're a little early. You see, Jerusalem doesn't become the capital of Israel until years later. Actually, Jerusalem is an ancient city. Uh, Archaeologists believe it started back around 3,500 B.C. That's long before Israel ever set foot into the Promised Land. And depending on which historian you consult um, this event right now of Israel entering the Promised Land, and what we're reading about is happening around 1,500 to 1,250 B.C., which means that Jerusalem was a city some 2,000 years before Israel ever set foot into the Promised Land. As a matter of fact, it's not conquered, and it doesn't become the capital of Israel until 400 years into the future. And so right now, Jerusalem is under control of the Canaanites and these pagans. Um, Pagans just simply mean that you're not a Jew, you're not a follower of God. Well, back to verse 1. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, verse 2 says this, he, that's Adonai Zedek, he feared greatly. Because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities. It was one of the big metropolises of the day. 
And because it was greater than Ai, and all of its men were warriors. We want to stop right there. And so we see that the current king of Jerusalem is upset at Gibeon, those no good traitors. Gibeon's covenant with Israel now took away a major strategic ally in Canaan's war against Israel. Not only that, Gibeon has great warriors, and her large and strategically located city now puts Israel right smack dab in the middle of the promised land and sprawling out. They are beginning to spread out into the promised land. And Canaan could not lose this ally. And they're not going to give up this ground so easily. Also, the king Adonai Zedek probably thought um, that this might inspire some of the more weak-willed, lily-livered Canaanites to maybe go to Israel and still try to make a treaty with them as well. And so Adonai Zedek wants to make an example of Gideon. So he starts by contacting four neighboring kings and kingdoms. Let's read on in verse 3. And so Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hohem, king of Hebron, and Piram, king of Jarmuth, and Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, just in case you were confused as to who they were, they gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And so now we see Gibeon is in big trouble. They have tricked their way into a treaty with Israel and now their neighbors are upset. I mean, they're mad. And not only that, Gibeon is greatly outnumbered. This is one kingdom against five. And it looks like destruction is all but certain. And what is worse, Gibeon has burned all of her bridges. They have nowhere else to turn because all of their Canaanite allies are upset. Well, almost no place to turn. Of all things, the only place that they can turn for help is Israel. And so as soon as the king sees the army advancing, before Gibeon is surrounded, he sends a runner to go and ask and beg Joshua and Israel, the very people that they just lied to and tricked and deceived, they're going to ask them to come and save them. Verse 6, And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not relax your hand. In other words, hey, don't rest. We need you to come and save us. Now look at the urgency of these words. Come to us quickly and save us and help us. You get the idea? For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. See, Gibeon is hanging by a thread and they know it. And Gibeon not only needs help, but our first point in our message today is Gibeon needs grace. Oh, Gibeon's already had mercy from Israel, and that mercy was extended by not destroying them. You remember, all of this covenant was made under lies and false pretenses, and Israel could have destroyed Gibeon, but they took mercy on him. They had pity. They did not do it. They wanted to hold to the covenant. But now... Gibeon is asking for much more. <laughs> Gibeon is asking for grace. It's been said that mercy is withholding punishment that is due somebody, but grace is far beyond that. It's favor. Let me illustrate this. Mercy is not giving a child a punishment even though they deserve it, but grace is not only withholding that punishment, but it's taking that child up in your arms and hugging them and kissing them and tickling them and giving them an ice cream cone and then giving them a present. That's grace. Mercy is catching a shoplifter in the act and deciding not to press charges. Grace is not only not pressing charges but then turning around and giving that shoplifter a shopping spree. If that sounds outrageous, let me throw another thing that's even more outrageous on you. Mercy is deserving instant eternal death for your sins that you just keep compounding and piling one upon another upon another. 
and yet God gives you a lifetime to repent of those sins. Grace is deserving death and given that lifetime to repent and then God himself sends his very son, his only son, to come and to die on the cross so that our sins can be covered and so that we don't spend eternity in hell. But that we actually spend eternity with Jesus in heaven and that we're actually called his sons and his daughters and that he actually comes and dwells with us and he actually gives us word to tell us how to operate in this life and he gives us a church and a church family to build each other up and to help guide us along the way and it just keeps going. This is grace. And for Gibeon, this is far less of a cry for mercy than it is a cry for grace because they are asking Israel to take a big risk. Now let's turn this around and take a look at this, not from Gibeon's perspective, but from Israel's perspective. Israel is still stewing and stinging over being tricked into this covenant they are, Gibeon is actually keeping them from land that God had promised them. And with this incident heavy and central on their minds, all of a sudden in comes a runner from of all places, Gibeon. And he, of all the nerve, he is asking them for help because there are Canaanites that are attacking them. And they say, come and save us. And I can't help but wonder, if Joshua and if Israel are thinking, my, 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 how the tables have turned. Isn't God good? Surely it must have crossed Israel's mind to allow Gibeon to just twist in the wind. Hey, if they let Gibeon be destroyed, they're, they're out of the covenant. They don't need to worry about that problem solved. They can even look at getting their land back. And all Israel has to do is just simply sit and wait and do nothing. They'll just simply take on who's ever left. I mean, surely that thought crossed somebody's mind. But here's the thing. They don't have time to debate. They don't have time to deliberate. Gibeon needs their help. What will they do? And so we come to point number two, and it's this. Israel extends grace to Gibeon. Verse 7. And so Joshua went up from Gilgal. He and all the people of, his, of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. Look, I want you to know this is a big deal because if things go poorly, Israel stands to lose here. I mean, you're rushing into a battle to save deceivers who have tricked you, and you're, you're, you're taking great personal risk. And this isn't some little force. This is a five-kingdom army. And they could lose valuable soldiers in their battle, ongoing battle against Canaan, and all to protect a people who've tricked them out of land. And so what does Israel do? Well, they extend grace to Gibeon at great personal risk. Joshua and Israel quickly moved to defend their deceptive allies. Despite Gibeon's cunning and trickery, Israel ex is extending grace to Gibeon. They are showing God's favor to them. They are going to come rushing to defend Gibeon, of all things, as if Gibeon is one of the very tribes of Israel itself. Well, let's look at verse 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Now, it appears to me that Israel has learned from their past mistake in the last chapter. In the last chapter, they did not seek God's direction. In this chapter, they have. And God said that he is with them. Verse 9. And so Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up, all night from Gilgal. Now that's an interesting phrase, having marched up all night. Um, Gibeon was some 19 miles away from Israel's camp. Israel was camping close to the ruins of Jericho. And at the news of the messenger, Israel quickly musters her troops and sets out on a long, tiring, double time, uphill march to Gibeon. This march was at night in very rugged, steep terrain 
And so here's Israel, and they climb and claw their way, not only 19 miles, but all the way it's uphill, 4,000 feet climb. And they did it all in the dark. But here's the thing. Israel's nighttime march now has given Israel the element of surprise. And they catch the unsuspecting five kingdom army off guard. Now I want you to watch. Not only as Israel fights the battle, because Israel is in the thick of it. They are in the heat of the battle. But I want you to watch as God delivers three miracles to make sure that Israel wins this battle. Verse 10, we see the first miracle. And the Lord threw them, that's the five kingdom army, threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent to Beth Haran and struck them as far as Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Ezekah and Makedah. And so here you have three miracles. Miracle number one, God throws the army into panic. You see that, it says the Lord threw them into panic. But God is not done. Look at verse 11. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent to Beth Haran, get this, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiel, and they died. And there were more who died because of the hailstones. We get a little more insight. This is hail. More of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Now, this hailstorm is not just happenstance. It's not just a coincidence. Verse 11 says, it is the Lord who is doing this. And I have no idea how large those hailstones were, uh, but I know this. Uh, This is the largest hailstone on record. It fell in South Dakota. It's a whopper, a diameter of eight inches across, about the size of a volleyball, weighs just around two pounds. You can imagine getting beamed with one of those things. It would, it would take you out. And you've got to understand that these soldiers are wearing armor, right? And yet, this hail took out more soldiers than what the Israelites did. By the way, um, here's just another quick, um, even some smaller hail. And you can see damage to cars. And maybe many of you have experienced that kind of damage firsthand. Well, we're not done with the miracles. There's one more miracle left, verse 12. At that time, Joshua spoke up to the Lord in the day, and he says, when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And so here we see who is winning the battle. It is the Lord. And Joshua, and he, this is Joshua, said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Then we continue on. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? This is one of his, Israel's history books. And the sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. And there had been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of man. And get these last words of verse 14. For the Lord fought for Israel. And so here's miracle number three. God extends the day. Uh, by the way, um, this, I, I love this painting. This is a painting that's hanging in the National Art Gallery in Washington, D.C. Uh, we saw this last year when we were on vacation. It's entitled Joshua's Longest Day. If you zoom in, and you can see here, this is actually su- uh, supposed to be Joshua and some of the priests. And uh, here are the Israelites as they're chasing down the Amorites. They're down here. You can see hail's coming down, getting ready to come down. So just an interesting artist rendition of the event. I think it's important to note here, too, that many commentators and scholars spend pages uh, diving into this last miracle on exactly what it meant to extend the day. And uh, there are all kinds of questions about, did this really happen? And some people say, no, it's an eclipse. Some people say, no, it was just a trick with the clouds. And then others really get into all kinds of uh, possible scientific explanations. Did God slow or even stop the rotation of the earth? I mean, how in the world could this happen? Um, On one hand, I appreciate the commentators delving into this miracle. That's their job. They, they, they're trying to give us, the readers, more insight into what's happening. But I don't want us to get bogged down in a single miracle here. This is one of three, and this miracle is a far bigger story here. And I believe that if we just focus on that, we miss the point of the text. 
And the text, I believe, is telling us two important things. First, and maybe the most obvious, is that God is fighting Israel's battle. Verse 14 makes that crystal clear. God is fighting the battle for his people. Boy, that should be a great encouragement to us, church. God fights our battles for us. Now, we're in the heat of the battle, (laughs) but God is the one who is fighting for us. The second thing I believe the text is telling us, and this is what I want to spend the rest of our time focusing on. And before I get into that, let me start by asking two important questions. First question, who was God fighting for? Pretty obvious, we just went over it, Israel. Verse 14 makes that obvious. Here's the second question, who's Israel fighting for? It's Gibeon, right? Why did Israel go into this battle in the first place? Israel didn't go, oh, we're going to go take on these five kings just to gain more land. No, they are going to defend Israel. Gibeon. And do you think that it has escaped God that Israel is actually fighting for Gibeon? Of course not. God knows that Israel is fighting for Gibeon. And God is still blessing Israel in battle so that Israel can then turn around and bless Gibeon. Do you see that? Do you see that God blesses Israel so that Israel can be a blessing to Gibeon. Let me put it another way. Point number three. God supplies abundant grace to Gibeon through Israel. God supplies abundant grace to Gibeon through Israel. Here's another interesting question. Could not God have just simply wiped out that five kingdom army on his own? Did he need Israel to go up there and be involved? Well, God can do whatever he wants, and he certainly could have done that, but God did not. God chose to work through Israel and in that way bless Gibeon. Church, this is such an important point. I want to make sure that we don't miss this. This was God's intention of what he wanted Israel to be. Early in Exodus, God told Israel that he wanted them to be a kingdom of king, or a nation of kings and priests. He wanted them to be a light to the Gentile nations all around them. Even in prophecy, he continues to talk about that, that Israel would be a light. And this is an outworking of that. Have you ever noticed that one of God's favorite patterns is to use his people to extend his grace to others. And I believe that this is a wonderful message that's embedded right here in Joshua 10. And God is blessing Israel by fighting for them. He makes that very clear. He is fighting the battle for Israel. And yet Israel is fighting the battle to save Gibeon. And isn't it wonderful But two things happen here. That Israel extends God's grace and saves Gibeon. And in the process, five kings and kingdoms now belong to Israel. This is the wonder of God. When we extend his grace, we are blessing others. And God blesses us in the process. And just like God is using Israel to bless Gibeon, God wants to use us to bless others with grace. God doesn't want his abundant grace just to dead end into us. God wants his grace to flow through us so that we can bless others. God wants us to be like Israel in this story, extending grace on behalf and for the benefit of others. If you think about it, God wants grace to flow through us like a river. And yet how many of us, instead of being a river, become a stagnant body of water because we receive and we receive and we receive grace. But you know what? When it comes to giving it out, well, (laughs) not so much. Let me give you another illustration. 
Um, hey, how many of you have ever been out west for vacation? Let me see hands. I love the west. Uh, one of our favorite vacations of all time is that we flew into Salt Lake City as a family. Then we rented a car and we drove up to Yellowstone Park. And uh, on that trip, we saw two bodies of water. Um, one is the Great Salt Lake and the second is the Yellowstone River. Both are comprised of water. But there's just about where the similarity ends. Let's start with the Great Salt Lake. Um, it's a lake filled with salt water. And the lake is enormous. I mean, you can see it on the top of the map here. It covers an area of 1,700 square miles, 75 miles long, 28 miles wide. It's the largest lake west of the Great Lakes. And as I said earlier, the water is salty. Parts of the Great Salt Lake are actually 10 times saltier than the ocean. And if you've ever got a mouthful of ocean, you know it is salty. By the way, this isn't snow up here. Um, this is salt that is on these rocks. The Great Salt Lake is so salty that there is no fish in it, that there are no plants in it. It supports no life except for tiny little brine shrimp, tiny little brine flies, and bacteria. Bacteria that can actually change the water from clear to pink. The water is lifeless and just about completely useless. It's not drinkable. It's way too salty to desalinize to take the salt out. It's too salty for irrigation. You irrigate with this water, you will kill the plants that you're trying to feed. And here's the thing, the lake is fed by some of the purest water in the whole United States. The water comes from snows melting off of the Wasatch Mountains that forms three rivers. And these three rivers of crystal clear, cool water flow through the desert into the Great Salt Lake. And then they just stop. And the water goes nowhere. And the Great Salt Lake is all but dead. It is an H2O desert in the middle of a sand desert. Now compare that to the Yellowstone River. The Yellowstone River is also fed by snow that's melting off mountains. But instead of holding the water and keeping the water in a dead-end basin, the Yellowstone River flows up to 9,000 cubic feet per second. In a decade, at that flow rate, the Yellowstone River could fill five of the Great Salt Lakes. The Yellowstone River is a 695-mile long river. It is the longest undammed river in the lower 48 states. It flows through three states, feeds seven major rivers and countless streams and tributaries. The Yellowstone River's waters bring life through countless species of fish and water life, countless plants and trees and inland ecosystems. The river also supports miles and miles of irrigation and millions and millions of gallons of drinking water. And the water stays fresh and brings life because of the countless gallons of waters that flow into it, that flow through it, and that flow out of it. Church, the point I'm trying to make with all of this is this. I think God is calling us to be channels, to be streams and rivers of his streams of living water. He wants us to flow in us, he wants us to flow through us, and he wants it to flow out of us. God is calling us not only to receive his wonderful grace, which is astounding, but he's calling us to share that grace with others. And my question to all of us this morning is how are we doing with that? Are we just receiving God's grace and that's our existence? Man, we just receive and, man, this is great. Praise God, we're just receiving. This is wonderful. I love this. And yet we never, ever give. Have we become like the great salt lake that has grown stagnant, never giving life, never quenching thirst, only receiving and never giving? Is God's grace just dead-ending into us? Or we like the great Yellowstone River, not dammed up in any place. It's flowing freely and bringing life wherever it flows and wherever it turns. 
God's abundant grace flowing through our life in great quantities because it never stays there long. It comes out in life-giving, thirst-quenching love and life to others. I'm bringing this back to the to the idea of what we've just read. I think this is why God bless Israel and fought their battle for them. Because Israel responded with grace. Do you notice in the order, I, 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 can't, I can't tell you exactly what it is, I just know what I'm reading, and the order is that Israel decides that they're going to move to save Gibeon. They go, oh, but we better check with God. Notice then that God says, yep, go, with, go, I'll be with you. But it appears to me that the decision was made first to show grace. And then doesn't God show up in a huge way? Three miracles extending even more grace. And not only is Israel able to save Gibeon, but then Israel takes out five kings in the process. And so my question to all of us is, how are we doing with the grace that God gives us? And maybe even a more important question is, why does this matter? Well, in Romans 8, 29, it says that we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. And Jesus poured out his very blood in his gift of grace to us. And we are to be emulating, becoming in that very image. Church, now more than ever, I think we need to be givers of God's grace. And I don't know if you think about it in this way or not, but all of us here in this room were called for such a time as this. And boy, are we living in times. It's been a long, long time Matter of fact, I don't know if I ever remember it being this divisive, this fractured, this emotionally charged, people this angry and upset, brother turning against brother, church turning against church. My friends, let us be a church of God's living grace. Let us be rivers of God's amazing grace. Let us show not just mercy, but let us show grace. Let us show favor, even to those who we vehemently disagree with on some issues. That's okay. But God calls us to show love and joy and peace long-suffering, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and faithfulness. These are the fruits of the Spirit. This is grace. Church, if we're to be known, let us be known as people of grace. Let us be known as followers who love one another, no matter how dark it gets outside these four walls, within our church, and obviously metaphor for the four walls, within our church, let us be a light. And let us express God's grace. My friends, I think that's a great lesson of Joshua 10 that God is a wonderful God that will bless us, that God will fight our battles for us, he does fight our battles for us, and that God expects us to use our victories to then show grace to others. God gives us his love and grace so that we can shower that love and grace on others. And my question to us is, are we a flowing river of God's life carrying abundant grace to others like Israel did for Gibeon. A nation that had cheated them out of a city and land. Or are we a stagnant pool that is lifeless, only receiving but never sharing? Church, may we always be a flowing source of God's grace to others. Well, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, um, boy... What challenging words for my heart this morning. Lord, I know I haven't always handled things correctly. I know that I can tend to step all over myself and botch things up. Lord, may all of us examine our hearts and where we stand in this. 
And Lord, if we've made mistakes, let us repent. And then, Lord, let us move forward in your abundant grace to show and share others, to live out for others your abundant grace. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, it is time for communion.